Hello everyone, and welcome to the second installment of Photocracy Skillshare, Get Fit in the New Year and for Life. My name is Dick Talens, one of the co-founders of Photocracy, and I will be taking you through the nutritional aspect of this Skillshare. So I would like to start off with a case study. It's a case study about a person named Joe and his New Year's resolution, which I'm sure many of you guys have made. Uh, Joe says that he's going to get in shape and eat healthy. So here's what Joe looks like. Joe is not obese by any means. Uh, obviously he's not skinny. He's slightly overweight. Joe actually went to the doctor recently and had his blood pressure and cholesterol checked. Uh, neither of those were great, but he's not in any imminent health danger. That being said, Joe really wants to get in shape because he's tried every single year for the past four years uh, with not much avail. Uh, so he thinks that this year is the year that he's going to be able to do it. So Joe creates a plan. He's going to wake up early every single morning. He's going to have a big breakfast because Joe hears that breakfast is the most important meal of the day. And he's going to hop on the treadmill for 30 minutes as hard and as fast as he can. Oh, he also wants to do this every single day in January. He thinks that if he can keep this up for 31 days, he's going to see amazing results afterwards. So it's the end of day one. And Joe is successful, but he is completely exhausted. Uh, he's not really used to eating breakfast, and so by the time he downed his breakfast uh, to go running, his sides started cramping up on the treadmill, um, and he felt like he wanted to vomit by the end. But that all pales in comparison to the fact that Joe is successful. Uh, so he feels great after day one. Uh, he has some luck on day two and day three, uh, but unfortunately on day four, Joe was a little bit too tired to wake up and go running. Uh, same thing with day five. Uh, so by the end of the first week, Joe went five out of the seven days that he planned to. He hops on the scale at the end, and he's lost a little bit more than half a pound, which is pretty good for him. Um, it's the first time that he's lost weight in a while, uh, so he's pretty encouraged by these results. But unfortunately, the next week, Joe had to travel, which completely knocked him off his schedule uh, and he missed a few days of running because of that. Also, there was that happy hour that he had with some co-workers where he had one too many margaritas, uh, and that wasn't too conducive with his new lifestyle. By the end of the second week, Joe hops on the scale again, and he's actually gained 0.3 pounds. Uh, I mean, he's still lost weight overall, 0.3 pounds in total, but to Joe, that's extremely demotivating because he's almost back to where he started. In fact, Joe is so demotivated that he doesn't feel like waking up early to go running for the next few days. So Joe is pretty on and off about running until the end of January. By the time February rolls around, his New Year's resolution is no more than a memory. Now, it's sad, but this is actually the most common New Year's resolution failure story that I've heard. People will often start off extremely hot at the start of January. Um, they will go on a streak and see some really good results. And then inevitably, they'll get derailed at some point. By the time February or March rolls around, uh, their New Year's resolutions are over, and they're hoping for better luck next year. Now, we'll come back to this case study and talk about why Joe failed, uh, and what he or you could have done to prevent that failure from happening. Before we move on, I would like to talk about two more stories. The first story is about a study that took place in England in 2011. Uh, the study sought to answer the question, how much weight do people lose from aerobic exercise? Um, so the study took 320 women. It split them up into a test group and a control group. It asked the women in the test group to exercise for 45 minutes a day, five days a week. Uh, and it asked the women in the control group not to exercise at all. One more thing to note is that researchers asked women in both groups not to make any changes to their dietary habits. By the end of one year, the weight of the test group and the weight of the control group were both taken, and unsurprisingly, women in the test group lost four and a half pounds more than women in the control group. Uh, now, four and a half pounds isn't bad. You know, most men and most women would love to lose four and a half pounds. Uh, but when you actually dive into the numbers, uh, you'll see something pretty astonishing. So, as it turns out, people in the test group averaged 180 minutes of exercise per week. Uh, if you look at the amount of fat that they lost, four and a half pounds, you'll realize that it took them, on average, 
35 hours to lose one pound of fat. So this brings me to my next story. Uh, and it's a story about this homeboy over here, a professor at Kansas State who went on the Twinkie diet. Uh, so he basically said, I'm going to eat crap every single day. I'm going to eat Twinkies. I'm going to eat Ho-Hos. I'm going to eat Doritos, Oreos. Basically, anything you find in your average um, you know, gasoline convenience store. But I'm going to put one restriction, and that restriction is that I'm only going to eat 1,800 calories every single day. He does this for 10 weeks, and guess what happens? He drops 27 pounds. Not only does he drop 27 pounds, but his HDL, the good cholesterol, goes up, and his LDL, the bad cholesterol, goes down. So how is this fair? How can you have one group of people exercise 45 minutes a day, five days a week for an entire year, and only lose four and a half pounds when this dude eats crap and loses 27 pounds in 10 weeks? Now, obviously, I'm not saying that you should eat like crap. Uh, far from that. But this demonstrates an extremely important point uh, that we'll get to uh, sometime in this Skillshare, and it's that calories are the number one thing that dictates weight loss. So without further ado, let's jump into the meat of this course. Now I apologize if any of this is super basic information for some of you. Uh, hopefully if it is, then it provides a good refresher on something that you've learned a while ago. What is a calorie? A calorie is quite simply a unit of energy. Uh, I know everyone here has probably heard of calories with regards to either exercise or food. Um, all foods contain calories. And conversely, all activities that we do utilize calories, whether that's intentional exercise like strength training or running, uh, or it's activities like walking to work. In fact, everything we do, even you know, maintaining normal bodily functions and breathing uh, or food digestion, utilizes calories. You can see the amount of calories that a food item contains by looking at its nutritional label. Um, they're usually front and center, so you can see here that this item contains 25 calories. Your body can store calories in multiple ways. Uh, one is through muscle tissue, two is via glycogen within that muscle, and three is through body fat. Uh, we'll talk about the third a little bit. One pound of fat is equivalent to 3,500 calories, which means that if I consume 3,500 more calories than I burn, I will put on one pound of fat. And conversely, if I utilize 3,500 more calories than I consume, I will lose one pound of fat. Aside from calories, you have this uh, other concept of macronutrients. All foods are made up of uh, a combination of these macronutrients. Um, and these macronutrients are protein, carbohydrates, and fat. Protein is the macronutrient that's predominantly found in meats, eggs, uh, but you also find them in lentils and nuts. Interestingly enough, uh, when it comes to satiety, in other words, how full are you after consuming a certain food, uh, protein yields the highest satiety. It's also used greatly in building muscle, which Brian talked about in the first Skillshare, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about later. The second macronutrient is carbohydrates. Uh, carbohydrates can either be complex carbohydrates or simple carbohydrates. Complex carbohydrates are found in bread, potatoes, rice, they're often what people refer to as starches. Uh, simple carbohydrates, on the other hand, are found in sugars, processed food containing sugars, uh, as well as fruit. The interesting thing about carbohydrates is that they are the only macronutrient that is not essential to our body. In other words, if we were never to consume another carbohydrate again, our body would make up for that by uh, producing the equivalent from fat as well as protein. Now the last macronutrient to discuss is fat. Fat is found in oils, butter, nuts, meat, although some cuts of meat contain more fat than others. For example, chicken thighs contain a lot more fat than chicken breast. Um, and unlike protein and carbohydrates, fat contains 9 calories per gram, whereas protein and carbohydrates contain 4 calories per gram. The interesting interesting trade-off here is that fat leads to a lot longer term satiety than uh, carbohydrates do. So while fat may contain more calories per gram, it also keeps you fuller for longer. Now unfortunately fat is one of those things uh, that's a little bit of a misnomer. 
the common misconception is that fat makes you fat, okay? Fat does not make you fat. Eating too many calories makes you fat. In fact, a lot of people have had really good weight loss success by adding fat to their diet and decreasing the amount of carbohydrates that they have. Uh, I mean, this isn't everyone. This is a certain type of diet that works for a lot of people. We'll talk more about it later. Um, but the important thing to take away is that fat does not make you fat. And the only way to lose fat is to create a caloric deficit. You'll hear a lot of books, um, a lot of what's called gurus say that they have the new secret to losing fat and it doesn't involve creating a caloric deficit. That is absolute BS. Um, as Lyle McDonald, a famous nutritionist, will say, uh, all diet books tell you that you don't have to reduce calories to lose weight and then trick you into doing it anyway. And if you look at every single diet and every single success story uh, where somebody has lost a good amount of fat, that person lost fat because they created a caloric deficit. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard of low-carb diets before. Some of those diets include Atkins, Paleo, uh, the South Beach diet, etc. Um, and these diets work, but they work because of what Lyle McDonald said about tricking you into consuming less calories. The proponents of these low-carb diets, however, uh, make a different claim, and they say that they cause you to lose fat irrespective of the caloric deficit that they create. So let's take a look at their claim and what the actual science says. Uh, so their claim is that when you consume carbohydrates, the fat storage hormone insulin is secreted. Uh, by the virtue of not consuming carbohydrates, insulin is not secreted, and thus you don't actually store fat. In fact, your body will utilize its own stored body fat as energy because insulin is not secreted and you are not consuming carbohydrates. Uh, there is some merit to this. Obviously, if you don't consume carbohydrates, insulin is not secreted. However, it's also secreted when you consume protein uh, and fat to some extent. The reality is, um, you know, there are several studies to indicate that this claim is probably not true. Uh, the first study is one by McLaughlin uh, in 2009. Uh, it looked at the differences of insulin levels among women who were dieting, and it found no significant difference in weight loss, uh, despite the fact that it fluctuated insulin levels in the subjects of a hypocaloric diet. Uh, the second is that when you actually take a look at people who consume milk, um, milk actually causes your insulin to spike higher than white bread, um, yet milk is not associated with higher um, body mass. In fact, it's associated with lower body mass. Uh, the last one is probably the nail in the coffin. Um, it's a study done in 2009, and it looked at dieters after one year of dieting, and it found no significant differences between low-carb and low-fat dieters. Now, all that being said, there is some merit to low-carb dieting, and I actually love low-carb dieting myself. Um, for one, when you're on a low-carb diet, you experience a very large rapid drop in water weight, and that's because uh, carbohydrates are stored within your muscle as glycogen. Um, they're stored within your muscle uh, accompanied by water, and so if you don't consume carbohydrates, uh, glycogen levels are lower, and you store less water as a consequence of that. So oftentimes you'll see somebody go on a low carb diet and they'll lose five pounds right off the bat. Uh, that five pounds is extremely motivational. Um, and as you'll see later, motivation is something that, you know, is extremely important when it comes to adherence to a diet. Uh, it's, it's also very hard to go on a low carb diet without consuming more protein overall. Um, higher protein leads to a higher what's called thermic effect of food. Uh, so your metabolism is actually raised slightly by the higher intake of protein instead of other macronutrients such as carbohydrates or fat. Um, this higher protein also that preserves more lean muscle, uh, blunts hunger, um, and you know Brian talked a little bit about insulin sensitivity earlier. Well, going on low carbohydrate diets tends to improve insulin sensitivity. Uh, you also restrict yourself to a lot healthier food choices. Uh, when you think about going on a low-carb diet because it cuts out a lot of crap like chips, Oreos, sugars, etc. that will often derail somebody when it comes to dieting. Um, lastly, it improves cholesterol levels over caloric restriction alone. So there's some, some interesting studies to show that 
if you're looking to improve your cholesterol levels, uh, going on a low carb diet might be better than going on one with carbohydrates, uh, calories held constant. Personally, I found that I actually do very well on lower carbohydrate diets. Uh, I tend to feel better than I do on higher carbohydrate diets. Uh, I'm less sluggish. I have less of an appetite. I feel more energetic. Uh, anecdotally, it seems like a lot of people who were formerly fat or uh, don't have the best insulin sensitivity tend to react better to lower carbohydrate diets. You'll find that people either react better to low carbohydrate diets with higher fat or they react better to higher carbohydrate diets with lower fat. So if you are dieting, you might want to try lower carbohydrate diets and see how you feel. Uh, if you feel sluggish and you feel like crap, which is you know what a lot of people report, uh, then maybe low carbohydrate diets aren't for you. But the most important thing is to maintain a caloric deficit if you're looking to lose fat. By the way, for those of you not looking to lose fat but looking to put on muscle, I haven't forgotten about you. We'll talk more about that later. And all the concepts we're talking about right now are 100% applicable to your case as well. While caloric deficits for fat loss are the most important thing, there are a few other concepts that are worth taking note. I keep talking about high protein and why you should consume higher protein in your diet. High protein is important because, first off, if you're dieting and you're losing fat, there's also a chance that you're going to lose muscle as well. So two things to prevent that. One is strength training. The second is consuming more protein. If you consume more protein, you'll tend to stave off any sort of lean muscle, uh, lean muscle mass loss as you're dieting. Taking in a higher amount of protein also leads to higher satiety. So if you're dieting, you'll feel a lot less hungry. If you're eating something like 500 calories from steak, than something like 500 calories from uh, you know, white rice. So how much protein should, should you actually take in one day? A good rule of thumb is to look at your target weight and take that amount of protein in grams per day. So for example, if I'm a 180 pound male looking to get down to 160 pounds, I'll target 160 grams of protein per day. If I'm a 140 pound woman looking to get down to 120 pounds, I will target 120 grams of protein per day in that case. Uh, I found that a lot of women have a harder time getting their target amounts of protein um, than men do. So if that's you, you know, get as much as you can until you can actually hit your target, uh, work your way up. It's also worthwhile investing in a protein supplement that will allow you to make sure that you hit your targets. Um, one good supplement to invest in is whey protein and each scoop of whey contains about 25 grams of protein or so. So if you find yourself you know, off by 50 grams of protein every single day, then you can add two scoops of whey, uh, which doesn't taste that bad. In fact, some flavors actually taste pretty good, and you'll be able to hit your protein target a lot easier that way. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about the hormone leptin, since uh, its implications are important when it comes to dieting. So leptin is a hormone that is secreted by your fat cells. It was once thought that fat was inert, uh, when in reality they secrete this hormone leptin, which helps your body maintain homeostasis when it comes to your weight. Um, and it does a, a whole bunch of other things, but that's the most important one for, uh, for your purposes. Um, so when you lose weight, your fat cells shrink. Uh, as your fat cells shrink, you produce less leptin, which signals to your brain that you're losing weight. In general, your body wants to maintain homeostasis. Um, you'll see that this is why a lot of yo-yo dieters uh, end up rebounding, because as they lose weight, uh, leptin drops, uh, their appetite increases, they get hungrier, their metabolism slows down, and their body basically does whatever it can to bring them back to the same weight. The interesting thing about leptin is that you can actually manipulate it. So you can raise leptin levels by consuming carbohydrates. Um, so increasing the amount of carbohydrates that you consume within a day will actually raise leptin levels. So if you've been dieting, especially if you've been dieting for a while, it's a good idea to incorporate what's called a refeed, uh, where you increase the amount of carbohydrates that you eat temporarily. Uh, this will raise leptin levels, which in turn will you know prevent you from uh, having a crazy appetite and prevent your metabolism from dropping too much. Uh, 
this is also why I never recommend going cold turkey and carbohydrates for a super long period of time. Even if you're doing something like a low carbohydrate diet, it's still important to get in a refeed once in a while, either once or twice a week if you've been dieting for a while, so that leptin levels don't stay low for too long. Now the last important concept that I want to talk about is a lot more psychological than it is actually physiological, and that is the return of investment on your time. So whatever you do in fitness, you want to make sure that the time that you put uh, you know, on that activity yields a very high return. This is why I don't recommend cardio for people who want to lose weight, because as you saw in, in that study earlier, uh, cardio yields a very low return on your time when it comes to weight loss. Obviously, cardio is great for a lot of other reasons. Um, it is great for health. It's great for fitness. Uh, it's great if you want to run a marathon. But when it comes to weight loss, it yields a very low return on time. Uh, I obsess over ROI of time on fitness, and here's why. ROI of time on fitness is heavily tied back to motivation and whether or not fitness becomes a main part of your life. So in order for fitness to you know, become a main part of your life, you need to be self-motivated. That means creating a positive feedback loop around fitness. So in other words, if I'm engaging in fitness activities that are moving me closer to my goals and that yield results that I'm really liking, I'm going to want to keep engaging in those activities. So you can see this equation here uh, that summarizes the strength of your feedback loop. Um, and your feedback loop strength depends on the rewards that you see from those activities versus the pain of completing them. Um, so in other words, if I'm pounding on the treadmill every single day at 6 a.m., it's incredibly painful, and I'm not really losing weight, I'm not going to want to keep that feedback loop going because it's not a very strong feedback loop. On the opposite end of the spectrum, if I am dieting and strength training, and dieting is an extremely difficult because you know I'm not very hungry and I'm eating a lot of food um, and I have a lot of fun strength training yet I'm seeing my weight go down and I'm looking better in the mirror I'm gonna wanna keep engaging in those activities so knowing that you can see why Joe failed Joe failed because he was running every single morning his weight wasn't really budging he wasn't paying very much attention to diet, and so he was focusing uh, his efforts on all of the low ROI activities while not embarking in any of the high ROI activities, and that's why Joe ultimately failed. So with all of that information behind us, we can now jump into some concrete nutritional strategies. First we'll focus on strategies for fat loss, uh, and then we'll talk about optimizing for muscle gain, which is not too, uh, too different from fat loss except for manipulating the calorie amounts. So strategy number one is creating a caloric deficit with uh, the minimum protein requirements that we mentioned. So just as a refresher, you're going to want to take in um, your body weight in grams of protein every single day. Uh, so again, if I'm a 200 pound male, I'm going to want to take in 160 grams of protein if my goal is to get down to 160 uh, pounds. So we create that deficit first by figuring out how many calories a day we need uh, to stay the same weight. This is called your maintenance calories. For men, it's 15 times your body weight, and for women, it's 14, 14 times your body weight. So again, if I'm a 200-pound man, I need 3,000 calories per day to maintain the same body weight. Um, Recall that a pound of fat is 3,500 calories. So if I want to lose a pound of fat per week, I need to create a deficit of 3,500 calories in one week. Uh, in other words, I'm going to need to create an average deficit of 500 calories per day. So instead of 3,000 calories per day, I will need to consume 2,500 calories per day. So what I would do is sign up for a calorie tracker or a food log like fitday.com or MyFitnessPal and start tracking how much you're eating. Uh, if you need to eyeball your food because you don't know the exact amounts, uh, do so and then plug in those values there. Eventually you'll get a lot better at estimating uh, the amounts of food that you eat. Uh, but start tracking those those amounts and aim for 2,500 calories a day, again if you're a 200 pound male, making sure that you get 160 grams of protein per day. 
The second diet strategy that I have here does not require you to count calories, but it does require you to stick to a set of macronutrient rules depending on the day. So you're going to split your days up into two different types of days, training days and rest days. Training days are days that you strength train, uh, whereas rest days are days that you don't strength train. On training days, you're going to keep your protein high, you're going to keep your carbohydrates high as well, but you're going to keep your fat low. So protein sources should be lean sources of protein like turkey breast, chicken breast, lean ground beef, and lean fish. Consume those in conjunction with low-fat carbohydrates like potatoes, uh, white rice, brown rice, etc. Uh, and make sure that fat is um, overall low for that day. Conversely, rest days are a little bit different. You're also going to keep protein high on rest days, but you're going to make sure that carbohydrates are low, uh, as low as possible, and that fat is a little bit higher. So on rest days, um, you can take a lot more liberties with the type of protein that you consume. You can consume chicken thighs, um, other cuts of you know chicken and beef and pork. Um, and although you want to keep carbohydrates low, um, one exception to this is green fibrous vegetables. So you can consume your meals in conjunction with broccoli, uh, fresh green beans, etc. Just make sure to keep starches um, and sugar low on rest days. So what's the science behind this? So on training days, I mentioned that we're going to keep fat low, which leaves uh, protein and carbohydrates as the predominant uh, macronutrients. So interestingly enough, protein and carbohydrates rarely, if ever, convert into fat. So even if we consume a lot of calories from protein and carbohydrates, uh, they'll likely never turn into fat. Actually, we'll probably not eat that many calories in general because we're restricting our calories um, to those two macronutrients. And whenever you cut out a macronutrient completely, uh, you end up consuming less calories. So, I mean, if you think about um, you know, foods that contain the most calories uh, and are the most calorically dense, you know, they're foods like ice cream, they're foods like pizza, which actually combine carbohydrates and fat. So by sure virtue of saying that all of our meals are either going to be high in carbohydrates or high in fat, but not both, we're eliminating a lot of different foods. So on training days, it's highly unlikely that we're going to consume a ton of calories that um, convert into fat. Rest days are very similar. Uh, in fact, a lot of people have found that if they completely eliminate carbohydrates for a given day, they actually consume a lot less calories. They don't consume many calories at all. Um, so on your rest days, you're eliminating carbohydrates, which helps increase your overall insulin sensitivity. Um, and then on your training days, you are consuming a lot of carbohydrates, which keeps leptin level from plummeting. Um, those in conjunction with the fact that your strength training and you're probably on an overall caloric deficit means that you can lose weight without needing to count calories just by these rules alone. Now a lot of people have brought up the question about saturated fat. Um, and saturated fat has been somewhat vilified by um, you know, science and the media as something that causes heart disease. Now this is absolutely not true. In fact, there was a recent meta-analysis done by Siri Torino in 2010 uh, that compiled a bunch of different studies and showed that saturated fat could not be linked to heart disease. Um, you know, for myself and all of my clients and all my friends involved in fitness, uh, saturated fat isn't something that we actively care about. And I've seen a lot of you know people post their cholesterol levels. Uh, I recently got my cholesterol checked, and it was perfect, um, probably better than most people who actively avoid saturated fat. Uh, so if you actually do some research, you'll find that the reasons that people originally vilified saturated fat and, you know, claim that it was linked to heart disease are actually quite flawed. In fact, in recent years, saturated fat has been somewhat vindicated. So now that we've covered fat loss, let's take a look at weight gain, in particular building muscle. So the first thing that you want to make sure you have when you're trying to build muscle is a proven program. Uh, that revolves around strength training. Some good programs for beginners are starting strength and strong lifts 5x5. Five five. If you're more intermediate, then you're going to want to try a program like Wendler 531 or Dog Crap. Yes, that's the actual name of the program, Dog Crap. Once you have that down, the nu nutrition side is actually pretty straightforward. 
So you're going to want to make sure that you eat at a caloric surplus. So consume more calories than you need during a day. So again, find your maintenance calories. For guys, that's 15 times your body weight. And for girls, that's 14 times your body weight. And start adding additional calories to that. A good place to start is 300 to 500 calories. And if you stop gaining weight, then you can also increase that amount. In addition to that, you probably want to stick to the macronutrient rules that I laid out in my second strategy. That'll help make sure that the weight you gain is in fact muscle and not fat. And we'll be able to see whether or not the weight that you're putting on is muscle or fat based on measurements. We'll look at that in the next section. Measurement is extremely important because measurement allows you to find out whether or not your progress is as intended. For either fat loss or strength gain, you want to make sure that you measure yourself under the same conditions every single week. So I re recommend first thing in the morning, hop on a scale, uh, take that measurement down, and also take a waist measurement um, right at the navel, which will tell you the circumference of your waist. If you're focusing on fat loss, you should be losing weight at the rate of anywhere between um, you know, half a pound to two pounds per week. If you stop losing weight, uh, or if you lose less than half a pound a week, you might want to consider increasing your caloric deficit. Anything more than two pounds a week, with the exception of the first week where you might lose anywhere between uh, you know, three and seven pounds, uh, you want to make sure that you're not losing more than two pounds a week because otherwise you might be actually losing muscle mass. If you're focusing on building mass and gaining weight, uh, the rules are very similar. You should weigh yourself once a week under the same conditions, uh, and you should take a waist measurement as well at the navel. These measurements will tell you if you are gaining lean mass or if you're gaining lean mass with fat. If you're gaining lean mass, then your weight should be going up, but your waist measurements should be staying about the same. Uh, on the other hand, if you see your weight going up rapidly, but your waist also going up rapidly, you're probably putting on fat along with muscle. Uh, in which case you might want to consider uh, lowering the amount of calories that you're taking in. But measuring every single week under the same condition is important. It'll tell you whether or not you're improving and going closer to your goals. And it will also strengthen the feedback loop that you have, uh, especially if um, you know your weight and waist measurements come out exactly like you want them. Unfortunately, this is all the time we have for this Skillshare class, um, but I'd like to leave you with one final message, and it's that this is a lifestyle, not a diet. In fact, dieting doesn't really work. If it seems like a lot of what I said was basic or intuitive, it's because it really is. Um, there's no real silver bullet or no secret to get you closer to your fitness goals, right? It's all about creating a sensible science-based plan and executing to get closer to that plan. Hopefully I gave you enough information about nutrition and creating a positive feedback loop for you guys to start forging your diet and your plan to reach any of the goals that you have in the new year. Uh, and make sure to stay tuned for the question and answer that Brian and I will be doing live. Again, thanks so much for listening to the Skillshare and good luck to getting to your goals in the new year.